Antarctica, the most inhospitable place in the world, but 100 years ago it was the site of a tragedy too horrific to imagine, as a man is forced to eat his dogs and trek 300 miles with the flesh falling off of his feet. 1912. The race to the South Pole is officially ended a year earlier, but the continent of Antarctica still holds many secrets for those brave or foolish enough to try and seek them out. It's as alien and inhospitable as land could exist on our planet, a place where most species on Earth couldn't hope to survive. But man's indefatigable spirit is undeterred by the frozen horrors at the bottom of the world. And joining the ranks of Antarctic explorers is Douglas Mawson. He sets sail for Antarctica and the crew is in good spirits. Nobody on board that ship has any ideas of the horrors awaiting Mawson and his men. Mawson is a talented geologist, and at 30 years old he's already world-renowned. A year earlier he's been offered a spot in what would become a disastrous expedition to the South Pole, opting instead to lead the Australasian Antarctic Expedition. He has no idea that this too will end in a horrible disaster. The South Pole might have been officially discovered, but Antarctica is vast land, and the human spirit demands it be charted, mapped, and its secrets uncovered. This is a once-in-a-millennium opportunity, the chance to officially explore a completely unknown continent. Will the explorers find human settlements there, surviving against all possible odds, unknown and curious monstrous creatures that can bear the constant freezing temperature? Perhaps even stranger wonders are waiting at the very southern tip of the world. The expedition set off from Australia, traversing the notorious treacherous Antarctic seas. Here winds gust so powerfully they leave the ocean in constant tempest, with waves many stories high tossing the ships around like toys in a bathtub. If something goes wrong in these waters, there is no rescue. If you're incredibly lucky, perhaps you're close enough to Antarctica to land on one of the many remote islands, where you'll slowly starve to death, desperately hoping a ship will pass by on the horizon and spy you. Ships are rare here, though, and you'd be luckier to simply drown in the freezing waters. The ship was blasted by storms, with the the waves nearly drowning the 48 sled dogs imported from Greenland and lashed to the deck. The weather became so bad that part of the ship's bridge was actually broken away by the waves, and any cargo stored on deck seriously damaged. The crew frantically fought to preserve the precious supplies, without which they would be as good as dead. A month after setting off, the expedition finally reached Antarctica, but it took until January for Mawson to find a suitable location for a base camp. He sailed into a gulf that would later be called Commonwealth Bay, but Mawson was forced to reduce his planned base camp from three to just two. Winter was rapidly approaching, and the coastline was so inhospitable that he was left with no choice but to consolidate his plans. This meant that the expedition's reach would be dramatically shortened, but also meant that any team that found itself in trouble would have less options for where to return for help. For a week, the men unloaded the ship. The work itself, sometimes outright stopped by the sheer ferocity of Antarctic winds. Finally, the ship was unloaded and hurriedly sailed away to establish the second base camp before winter moved in and locked the ship in ice for half a year. With camp established, Mawson split the expedition into four groups. One would man the base camp and the other three would trek into the uncharted continent and begin their scientific work. Mawson personally chose to lead what would become the Far Eastern Shore Party, which would take on the most dangerous assignment. Mawson's group, consisting of three men and over a dozen sled dogs, would survey glaciers several hundred miles from base camp. They would have the furthest distance to travel and help would be impossible to send if things went wrong. And things could go very wrong indeed, as the landscape the expedition would travel through was fraught with loose ice and massive crevasses, where one wrong step would send a man or a team of dogs plunging to their deaths. To make matters worse, the constant blizzards concealed these crevasses under a few feet of snow. It would be like walking in a minefield, but Mawson was determined and capable. Accompanying Mawson would be Lieutenant Belgrave Ninnis, a British Army officer and expert dog handler. Xavier Mertz, a champion cross-country skier, and one of Mawson's closest friends made up the third member of the team. The men were limited to just a few personal belongings, each of their three sleds loaded to the absolute limit with supplies, survival gear, and scientific instruments. Ninnis would opt to bring a novel by William Makepeace Thackeray, Mertz would bring several Sherlock Holmes short stories, and Mawson brought his diary and a photograph of his fiancée. Sleds straining with supplies and pulled along by 16 dogs, the expedition set off into the great unknown. The expedition made great time, leaving on November 10, 1912 and traveling 300 miles a month later on December 13. The weather had not seriously hampered their journey and only a few sick dogs had slowed their progress. Despite this, though, Mawson was plagued by bad omens. One night he had a dream of his father, and he knew innately that something was terribly wrong. He had left his parents in good health, but would later discover upon his return that his father had died unexpectedly just before he had his strange dream. The second bad omen left the men deeply shaken. One of the huskies had been pregnant, and after giving birth, the men found the dog eating her own puppies. This isn't unusual behavior for animals in such extreme circumstances, but the sight deeply disturbed the hardened Antarctic 
explorers. The last omen, though, came literally out of nowhere. Despite being nowhere near the coast, a large petrel suddenly smashed into the side of one of the sleds, breaking its neck and dying on impact. The men were left completely baffled, wondering how the big bird could have possibly flown so far inland only to end up smashing into their sled. Things, however, quickly began to get worse for the explorers, and the omens turned very real. As the team traveled to the blizzard-scoured landscape, they knew that every step was treacherous as the thick snow hid deep cracks in the ice beneath their feet. A sure portent of the doom to befall him soon, Ninnis narrowly escaped plunging to his death through these hidden shafts in the ice three different times. To make matters worse, he had developed an abscess on the tip of his finger. With the pain becoming insufferable, Mawson was left with only one choice, lance the abscess with the tip of his knife, and without the benefit of any anesthesia. Mawson, however, had not been spared either. The bitter wind had dehydrated his lips, causing a nasty crack along one of his lips that split it and sent shooting pains across his face. Mertz had seemed to avoid any serious ailment, and his ever-cheerful disposition helped keep the men in good spirits, despite the worsening portents. Making camp on the night of December 13th, the group was disturbed by a haunting, otherworldly sounds. Massive booms and cracking noises plagued their sleep, with Mawson and Ninnis completely bewildered by what sounded like thundering artillery beneath their feet and around them. Mertz, however, was all too aware of what was happening thanks to his experience as a cross-country skier. Warmer air had been sucked down into the ice fields through various crevasses, causing the arches beneath their feet and ahead of them to collapse, one by one. Unsteady ice beneath their feet would soon claim its first victim. The next day came with relatively good weather, and the party packed up camp and proceeded to make good time. At around noon, Mawson noted the position of the sun, and then, standing on the runners of his sled as the dogs pulled it along, began to make the calculations needed to determine their location. Ahead of the group rode Mertz on skis so he could scout out a safe path through the field of crevasses. Mawson suddenly realized that Mertz had stopped singing his cheerful Swiss student songs and spotted him stopped with a ski pole raised in the air, a sign that a crevasse lay ahead. With the expedition stopped, Mawson called out a warning to Ninnis, who was bringing up the rear, then returned to his calculations. Engrossed by his work, Mawson realized moments later that Mertz had stopped again and was looking back in alarm. Looking over his shoulder, Mawson realized what he had failed to notice earlier. So busy with his calculations, Ninnis was gone. The man and his sled dogs had vanished into thin air. Frantically, Mawson and Mertz hurried to backtrack over a quarter mile to where they'd crossed the crevasse Mertz had spotted. They kept hoping that Ninnis had simply been lost out of sight behind a snow hill, but as they neared the crevasse, the truth slowly made itself known. Right before the two men was a hole in the snow, 11 feet across, with the tracks of Ninnis's sled and dogs running straight into it. No tracks were visible on the other side. Mawson threw himself on his stomach and slowly crawled over to the edge of the crevasse, risking his own life in a further collapse. Finally reaching the edge, he looked over and down into the dark abyss, his eyes taking time to adjust to the dim light that reached into the depths. He could barely make out a ledge at the very edge of his vision, upon which were two dogs, one dead, killed on impact, and the second pathetically moaning and writhing in pain. Past the ledge, nothing but darkness. The two men called out Ninnis' name over and over again, receiving no response but the whimpers of the fatally injured sled dog. Using a fishing line, they sounded the depth to the visible ledge, 150 feet, well out of the range of their available rope. Any hopes of climbing down to the ledge were dashed, and yet the two men stayed by the hole calling out Ninnis' name for five hours, hoping he had merely been stunned in the fall. Eventually, the men were forced to give up, leaving Ninnis buried hundreds of feet in Antarctic ice, where he'll remain until the continent of Antarctica thaws and melts untold thousands of years into the future. Mawson and Mertz held an impromptu burial service by the lip of the crevasse, then pondered how Ninnis had fallen into the crevasse while they had safely crossed over it. Ultimately, they decided that Ninnis had been running beside his sled instead of on the runners. This concentrated his body weight into a much smaller area, which caused the snow beneath him to collapse. Ultimately, the collapse doomed the entire entire sled and dog team as the expanding hole quickly swallowed up all of them. But the survivors now faced an even greater problem than icy crevasses. The lead sled had been most likely to run into danger, and thus most of the food and their only tent had been loaded onto the rearmost sled, the one least likely to run into difficulties. This left the men with only a week and a half of food and their sleeping bags to weather the Antarctic blizzards in. Doing some careful calculations, the men decided that if they ate the dogs one by one, they could possibly get to their designated winter camp in time. The men immediately hurried back to their last campsite, where they had abandoned one of the sleds that was no longer necessary due to their dwindling supplies. They pulled the sled apart and fashioned it into a rough shelter, and as they dug into the snow to spend the night, calculated their next course of action. They had two choices available to them. They could opt to head for the coast. This path would be longer, but the men could possibly hunt seals, and if they were extraordinarily lucky, spot the supply ship, or they could instead head back the way they had come. This choice would be the fastest, but offered no possibility of hunting. The choice was made. They would return the way they came, and that night they killed the weak 
sickest of their dogs, feeding the remains to their surviving dogs and eating some for themselves. The rest would help supplement their dwindling rations. The men made good progress for the first few days, but the harsh sun bouncing off the white snow gave Mawson a serious case of snow blindness. His sunburned eyeballs not only blinded him, but caused him severe pain. Mertz treated his eyes with a solution of zinc sulfate and cocaine, but the pain and crippling blindness caused the men to slow down. Every hour of travel time they lost meant less rations and less chance of making it back to their winter camp. Standard rations soon ran out, and as the dogs weakened and became sick, the duo were forced to kill them and butcher them for meat. The meat was boiled thoroughly, which caused the normally difficult-to-eat muscular tissue and gristle to be reduced to a jelly-like consistency, leaving absolutely nothing to waste even the paws were eaten, though it took a very long time to boil until the meat was edible. By January 5, 1913, the men were in extremely bad condition. Mertz was suffering worse than Mawson, though, who had recovered from his snow blindness. The wool that the men used to keep themselves warm actually absorbed moisture, which not only lowered their body temperature, but also made the men's bodies damp with melting snow and sweat. The constant chafing and physical exertion led to the skin on Mertz's legs to begin to come off. Eventually, the normally cheerful Swiss was forced to beg Mawson to give them a day's rest that they might recuperate. For 24 hours, the men stayed huddled in their sleeping bags, their sled dogs long since dead and eaten, and with few surviving rations. The next morning, Mawson found Mertz to be completely delirious. He'd also developed diarrhea, and unable to control his bowels had relieved himself inside of his sleeping bag. Mawson took the time to clean his friend up as well as the sleeping bag, and then helped him climb back inside to warm up. Eventually, Mertz was coherent and strong enough to begin to travel once more, but as the two trekked ever onward, Mertz's delirious fits became stronger and stronger. Finally, on January 8th, Mertz died peacefully in his sleeping bag at around 2 a.m. 100 miles from camp, Mawson was on the verge of a complete physical breakdown. His nose and lips had split open due to exposure, and walking had become absolute agony. As he removed his boots and socks to investigate, he found that the skin along the bottoms of his feet simply fell away, exposing a mass of open blisters. Despite the pain, he bandaged the skin back onto his feet and pressed on. He was now driven by a desire to see his beloved fiance again, and by a sense of duty to report on the fate of his two friends, that they should not die, their fates unknown to loved ones. By the end of January 13th, now making only five miles a day, Mawson could finally see the vast plateau that ended at the base camp. So close to rescue, Mawson willed his broken and frozen body forward into the dangerous ice fields that stood between him and safety. But these ice fields still held the hidden dangers that had claimed Ninnis's life. Terrified of falling to the same fate as Ninnis, Mawson slowly worked his way through the ice fields, testing each step. However, on January 17th, his luck ran out, and one misstep opened up a hole in the snow beneath him. Incredibly, the fissure was too narrow to pull in the half sledge that Mawson had been using to carry his meager supplies, and his fall to a certain death was stopped only by the sledge becoming wedged and the very thin rope that connected him to it, dangling by a slowly fraying rope as friction against the ice cut away at the strands that bound it together. Mawson made an attempt to pull himself up and to safety. However, his raw, frozen fingers could barely wrap around the rope, and each attempt cracked open his skin, causing him to bleed profusely. He fell once, twice, three times, each time expecting the ever-thinning rope to simply snap and send him plummeting to his doom hundreds of feet below. Knowing he had the strength for one final attempt, Mawson wrapped his bloodied and broken hands around the rope and made one final Herculean effort. His thoughts turned to the woman he loved, and he summoned the strength to drag himself up one handhold at a time, until incredibly he reached the surface and dragged himself out. Utterly exhausted, he lay for over an hour, until finally he dragged his surviving packs away from the crevasse and crawled into his sleeping bag. That night, though, he fashioned a rope ladder which would make it easier to escape should he fall again. The very next day, that rope ladder saved his life as he fell into yet a second crevasse. Pushing himself with superhuman willpower, Mawson was reduced to just four miles a day, his many injuries and wounds sapping his strength. His hair had begun falling out, and the bottoms of his feet were by now a mass of open blisters. Frostbite seemed to have consumed his entire body, and he feared having to amputate one or more of his fingers. Incredibly, throughout his ordeal, Mawson's navigation had been flawless, and on February 1st, he reached a supply cache they'd nicknamed Aladdin's Cave. Mawson tore open the supply crate and wept at the sight of three oranges and a pineapple, exclaiming later that he was overcome by emotion at the sight of seeing something that wasn't white. Now, mere miles from the base camp, Mawson prepared for the final push to safety, only to be immediately assailed by the worst blizzard he'd ever experienced. For five days, he was forced to lie in his icy hole as the wind whipped up into a seemingly supernatural frenzy. Finally, though, the wind died down and Mawson was able to make the final few miles to camp, just in time to see the expedition ship leaving for Australia before the winter weather froze it in place. A small party, however, had been left behind to wait for Mawson and were horrified to discover his condition as he stumbled into camp. Against all odds, spurred on by love for his fiancée and a desire
conspired to tell the fate of his comrades, Mawson had done the nearly impossible and survived a 300-mile trek with barely any supplies. While he was forced to wait out a winter in Antarctica, he discovered that there was a hidden blessing. It allowed him to mentally recuperate from the horrors he had endured before finally sailing home. Now, check out I Was Trapped for 49 Days After Plane Crash, True Survival Story, or click this other video instead.